Hello and welcome to the In Publishing podcast. My name is James Eafley and I'm the editor of In Publishing. My guest this time is Alex White, Managing Director with responsibility for the food and parenting portfolios at Immediate Media. She looks after brands such as BBC Good Food, Olive, Made for Mums and Junior Magazine. Earlier in her career, she was the founding director of the Association of Online Publishers. In our chat, Alex gave me her views on what makes a great publishing brand. But for us, I think it's about really knowing what you're here for and what sets you apart and striving to be the absolute best at doing that and also being prepared to keep evolving and innovating to meet the changing needs of your audience. She spoke about BBC Good Foods publishing priorities. Our key strategic focus um, for a number of years has been on loyalty and engagement. Uh, across print and digital and we saw a big uh, boost in demand for magazine subscriptions as as many other publishers did Um, and you know as well as that we we use CRM tools to really understand what action users might want next to take and serve up targeted content and marketing messages based on what we're learning about people. And she talked about their ongoing efforts to improve diversity. So we've been working hard to make space both physical in terms of pages in the magazine and also in the conversation uh, for new voices and crucially diverting our editorial budget, putting our money where our mouth is and making sure that we're paying our contributors fairly. And that's been really key. Um, So we're really committed to trying to grow a new audience by introducing more diverse and inclusive content. Amongst many other things. Before we hear more from Alex, a quick word about our valued sponsors. We would like to thank our podcast sponsor, Air Business, a market leader in distribution and subscription management services for the publishing industry. Its end-to-end service includes subscriber acquisition and marketing strategy, worldwide distribution, digital mail and e-commerce fulfillment, and warehouse and freight logistics. For more information, visit airbusiness.com. Alex White, welcome to the In Publishing podcast. Thank you very much. Now, Alex, can we start things off with you giving us uh, maybe a quick overview of your role and responsibilities at Immediate Media? Yes, of course. So I'm um, the managing director of Immediate's food and family groups, um, which encompasses on the food side, uh, BBC Good Food and Easy Cook and Olive magazines and websites. And on the parenting side, we've got the reviews and advice website made for mums and uh, Junior, which is a high-end kids fashion and shopping brand. Um, So at Immediate, um, brand MDs like me oversee the day-to-day running of those businesses um, end-to-end, so their operations and financial management and leading the content team and marketing team and business development people um, to deliver the products and the top line revenues um, and bottom line growth, basically. But we work as part of a matrix as well. So I work really closely with colleagues and specialists across a number of centralized teams uh, from advertising and circulation and commerce through to product and tech. Excellent. And now BBC Good Food has had a, an amazing couple of years. I think it was named, well, I know it was named PPA Brand of the Year last year. It's been shortlisted for the same award this year. Um, on the base of that, what, what would you say were the key characteristics of a successful publishing brand nowadays? Um, so it's a, it's a great question. And I think probably the recipe is a little bit different for, for all publishers. Um, but for us, I think it's about really knowing what you're here for and what sets you apart and striving to be the absolute best at doing that and also being prepared to keep evolving and innovating to meet the changing needs of your audience, um, be that in terms of consumer trends and relevant platforms or content focus as well. So, I mean, just not treading water, basically, and trying to to set the trends as well as follow them. So for BBC Good Food, how would you define what you're there for? What is the purpose or the thinking behind BBC Good Food and your as a brand? Yeah, sure. Well, I mean, essentially, we're here to to help everyone eat good food every day, which sounds kind of very, very simple. Um, But we are very much, you know, a mass market brand. We've got a very broad audience and, you know, we're here to to help people make the most out of every every mealtime. Be that, be that whether they're on a special diet or certain health goals in mind or working to a budget, we just want to make sure everyone gets the, the opportunity to eat well every every day. And, and as the brand has evolved uh, uh, over the last few years, 
are there any kind of key moments in that evolution? If you're to, let's say, rewind five years, did BBC Good Food now look very different to how it did five years ago? Um, yes, I think I think we do. I mean, we we put digital at the heart of our publishing strategy um, early on and, you know, very much embrace the opportunities offered by digital media and all those different channels um, for reaching an audience. Um, but I suppose about, yeah, about five years ago, we probably came to to that tipping point where the digital revenues were approaching print revenues and, and you know, and shortly afterwards overtook digital revenues. So, so we really are a, a multi-platform brand. Um, and I think our approach to publishing, you know, reflects that we just try to make sure that everyone working on the brand shares in the success of digital and doesn't feel isolated to one platform. Um, so, so yeah, it, it's been a real journey, but, um, we've, we've seen various stages of, of significant growth in our digital audience. And that's allowed us to, to kind of grow to the position that we're in today. And in terms of digital is obviously a key part of where you're going and as a brand, how how important is print still in the mix? Yeah, print is really, really important. Um, we've got a, a really strong stable of um, products in our portfolio um, for the print side. And that allows us to address a slightly different audience for Olive than we do for Good Food and Easy Cook again, a slightly different audience and obviously good food is the market leader in the food space in terms of magazines but together those those titles really do command the category so so print is really important um as i said you know still makes up just you know around half our revenues and having having those different revenue streams is really important to us especially as we navigated all of the the challenges of the last couple of years with with covid and again, we're looking at PP, sorry, BBC Good Food as a brand. How important is data um, to to creating a successful brand and maintaining a position? It's really critical um, for us. So yes, I mean we we're very fortunate to sit on an absolute wealth of user data. Um, you know, BBCGoodFood.com. You know, regularly attracts twenty five million odd users a month. So that's an awful lot of user data that we have potential access to, and we, we use analytics and uh, behavioral data to really try and understand that audience um, and respond to what they're looking for, segment it, and, you know, and basically tailor our content and marketing strategy and our commercial model uh, around knowing that audience really well. And in terms of brand building, um, you know, with other publishers of mine, you know, listening to the podcast, you know, they're, they're thinking about their own brands. What, what do you think are the common pitfalls publishers need to avoid if they're looking to achieve long term success um, with their brands? Yeah, um, well, in a way, it's kind of the inverse of, of what I was saying a moment ago that I think, you know, forgetting why you exist in the minds of consumers um, you know, if you spread yourself too thin and try to do too much or be all things to all people, um, that, you know, that can end up having a harmful effect on your brand. And sometimes I think we've been a bit guilty of that and have had to regroup and focus on the things that deliver the most value to our audiences. Um, you know, another watch out can be, you know, the temptation to compromise on those brand values in order to win business commercially or, you know, to not pay attention enough to what your customer is trying to achieve, be that your audience or your commercial partners as well, um, because that's that can be too, you know, short termist. So transparency, I think, with, with everyone that you're working with is really, really essential. And in terms of not damaging brand values, presumably that might mean turning comm some commercial deals away. Yeah, it it does. I mean, much as it breaks my heart, and and in a way, that's part of the the privilege and responsibility of working on uh, with the BBC as well. In terms of our brand license from the BBC, um, we work uh, very, you know, we work closely with our our colleagues there, and uh, you know, we adhere to BBC brand values uh, in terms of editorial and. Uh, and and commercial guidelines, which means we have to, you know, we, we have to be very, very strict about how we work and making sure, you know, it's that point about transparency, I guess, that, that the nature of our commercial relationships is always really clear to the user. Um, but that said, you know, we can we, we can still do most things that we want to be able to do. But I think it's just bearing in mind that win-win um, whenever you're working in partnership with people. 
and knowing why you exist, as you say, is 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 the key to being a successful brand. What what are the mechanics there? Is that just a question of you know you as you know as the MD um, reminding yourself every year to to ask that question, or do you have set set procedures in place which will kind of force a discipline on you as a team? Um, it's probably slightly less you know, formalized than that. But, you know, we are editor in chief, um, Christine Hayes, who I think has, has been a, a, on your podcast as well before. Um, she and her team, you know, work really closely uh, with me uh, in terms of defining those brand values, what we stand for and what we don't stand for and how those um, those brand values translate into content. So I think it's just part of the onboarding process for all members of staff when they join the team. And just something that we always have to bear in mind when we're thinking about the right approach to take when we're creating content. Now, at the start of your career, Alex, you worked in in TV, interactive TV and video. Um, How has that experience informed your approach to publishing? Yeah, so, I mean, those roles were the first ones of my career, basically. Um, And, you know, that was really in the very early days of content over the internet, um, quite entrepreneurial video on demand businesses that were probably a bit before their time. Um, You know, I should add, I was actually made redundant twice before I was 25, which was quite rough early in your your career. Um, You know, you may remember there was the thing called the dot-com crash when confidence Mm. fell away Mm. uh, from the industry and investors all pulled back. So, you know, it was quite a big learning curve for me that early on in my career. Um, but what those web TV and video companies really did was, you know, teach me to always be looking ahead to future media adoption and to to have an open mind about where our content may travel to in terms of emerging platforms. Um, so it was it was it was a fun and exciting time, actually. I, you know, it's a fun industry um, in any case. But, you know, at that point, uh, you know, it felt like a brave new world, really. Um, and being made redundant twice, I've certainly been made redundant once. I mean, how, how, very early on, how, how did you cope with that? Was that a bit of a oh, I think was I quite was... hard to take, or did you just bounce <laughs> back immediately? I think I was quite naive, um, to be honest. Early on in my career, there was a, a buyout as these things happen, and I was like, oh, you know, that'll be fine. Um, but yeah, it was it was actually quite challenging. But um, you know, fortunately. Uh, I was interested in a world where there was a lot of opportunity and actually not a lot of opportunity with with skills um, such as I brought from from my background. So, it, you know, it didn't take long to get back up on my feet again, but it did te- teach me that, uh, yeah, the online media world, it, there's a lot of change um, and uh, a lot of um, consolidation in terms of ownership and, and, and how the business works. Now, after the, the latest ABCs, um, which I think showed a 3% circulation growth, 3.2% circulation growth for BBC Good Food, you praised the brilliant editorial focus of the team. Um, are there any particular examples of that brilliance that stand out for you? Oh, so many. Um, so, I th- you know, the combination that, you know, that we employ uh, when we're thinking about our content operations, you know, a combination of audience insight and data analytics, as you mentioned, and then that editorial instinct and experience and that network of content uh, contacts is is such a powerful one. So we've had, you know, especially recently, so many award wins and nominations over the past year for individual editors and teams and people at the start of their careers. Um, our digital editor, our group digital editor, Lily Barclay, has just been shortlisted by the PPA and the AOP as editor of the year. And so is our editorial team overall. I mean, basically, you know, that team is really just a powerhouse um, feeding the recipe engine that is the mighty BBCGoodFood.com day after day and creating beautiful and inspirational and incredibly useful features and articles for the mag. Um, So I think what they're particularly great at is um, identifying and anticipating the mood um, of the of our audience, um, and never has that been more true than over the last twenty four months. In seeing how they've responded to the different phases of COVID, you know, it was quite astounding. Identifying, you know, the mood the nation would be in, be that shock initially and anxiety, and then boredom and fatigue, and then optimism, and probably uh, a circle of, of of those things over and over, um, and also in terms of what they're doing day to day really changed dramatically uh, with with the move to working from home so they were moving to the front line and helping people during the crisis broadcasting from their kitchens at home and 
being remote directed by our producer and live simulcasting video Q and A's with our users across all the social networks at once, you know, helping to people to troubleshoot their cooking issues and what to do if they can't find flour or eggs, um, how to get their sourdough to rise, all those sorts of um, problems that uh, that we saw playing out. You know, it was a phenomenal phenomenal um, effort, really. So. Yeah, they're just a fantastic team that is just always on the money in terms of what people are going to be looking for. So, so looking back to when you know a couple of years now, I mean, COVID seems to have been around for an awful long time. What what was the the mood you know after the lockdown was announced? I mean, how, how did you meet? What, what what was what was the thinking? What what did you do first? Um, how yeah, what what happened? Oh gosh, well, I think there was probably a certain amount of. Uh, Actually, I was going to say there was panic, but there wasn't actually panic. It was really quite uh, impressive. We had, I think we called it at a media about um, a, about a week before the nation went into lockdown. We realised we were going to have to do this. We had a, a test day where everyone worked uh, from home and joined Zoom calls to make sure everyone could get online. Um, and then I think about two days after that was it, we were working from home. And I think it was just it was very remarkable how swiftly um, our team just got their act together and understood what was what was needed and what people were going to need from good food during this time. Um, because certainly I think there was a, a moment of panic, you know, among the nation in terms of, you know, we saw that panic buying in the supermarkets, didn't we? And in the shops and people yes. could, couldn't get hold of stuff, um, you know, queuing up to get the most basic ingredients. It was it was quite a, a worrying time for people. And then when the schools closed, it was, you know, the challenge of trying to to work and look after your kids. And so I think, you know, we, we felt like we were going through that with people and trying to be with people during you know, during that time and support them on that journey and try and make it as, as easy as possible and give people ideas, um, ways to keep people, their children entertained, way, ways to feed people healthily and make the use, make the most of what they had available to them. Uh, and the working from home, is that still the case or has your team by and large come back to the office or, uh, and the kitchens and, you know, wh- where you do all your work? So it, we're in a bit of a hybrid um place I would say at the moment so the the office hasn't been closed as such and has been available for people you know if they if they actually found it difficult to work from home or impossible to work from home it's been there Um, but it by and large people have been creating the recipe content from their kitchens at home some of that has now moved back into the kitchen that we have at the office because it's just much much easier having the industrial ovens and fridges and so forth as you can imagine Um, but in terms of the day-to-day we're about half and half. I think most people are doing, doing about two or three days in the office and the rest from home, which seems to strike quite a nice balance for people. So the editorial focus, the editorial brilliance you refer to, is sounds like it's a combination of data insight and um, instinct and, and the expertise of the editorial team. Yeah, yes, but yeah, absolutely that. And we also work, you know, we've got an audience development team that works across all of our brands. So we work hand in hand with them, really understanding, you know, search trends, uh, what people are looking for, making sure that we can answer every query. So yeah, very much a team effort. Um, but uh, yeah, those those are the things really. And, and the, that development team, how do they how do they feed that information back to the editorial team? Is that what kind of processes is involved? It's really working hand in hand, really. Um, you know, we'll be looking uh, day in, day out at, you know, our, our ranking against our key search terms, um, what what gaps we're 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 we need to fill and then we'll work with our cookery team to to identify the best, you know, the best recipes that we need to create. Um in order to to generate the content that we need so we 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 create recipes specifically for for digital as you would imagine as well as um for print um and we have kind of we've merged our operations across our portfolio as well so our content team all work across digital and print and across good food and olive um so it was quite a a big restructure at the time that we that we did it but it's um it's stood us in really good in really good shape now, you also identified commercial incisiveness as another key pillar of the brand's success. Um, what, what do you mean by that? Um, well, I mean, it's a catch-all, I suppose, for, for a number of different things. But as you, as you say, you know, data is at the heart of what we, uh, of what we do. And we, we specialise in a strong understanding of our audience. 
uh, as a trusted brand. We know what our audience wants. We use our data to to inform us. And Immediate um, you know, has, has a technology platform and a data platform that we plug into alongside all the other the brands and combined with the audience development expertise, you know, those things have really helped to accelerate our digital advertising business and our commerce proposition and helped us innovate. Um, so in 2021, our commerce revenue, our e-commerce revenue was up 170%. Um, we gained the greatest share of voice in, sh- in search for reviews of food equipment and kitchenware. Um, so, you know, is really using data to inform, uh, inform our content strategy and our commercial strategy. So, all, you know, the way that we work is that all of our digital brands have migrated onto the one tech platform, which we call Fabric. Um, and that provides every site with the same content and data and subscriptions and commerce capabilities. Um, and that's helped to deliver some really substantial audience and revenue growth across the board. Um, for example, we can test new affiliate widgets or SEO strategies on small brands and then roll out to the whole platform. Or in our advertising business, we can quickly roll out new ad tech developments on multiple fronts or leverage the power of our first party data at scale across the multiple domains. Um, so it's that's kind of allowed us to innovate commercially. Um, you know, launch new content formats and deliver record um, digital subscriptions and advertising growth uh, and grow our audience, basically. So it, it's it's linking up our, our data with our content and commercial strategy. So in terms of new product development, uh, I'm sure lots of new things have launched uh, with your brands over the last few years. What, what's the, the process um, in terms of identifying the idea and then testing it and then bring it to market because i imagine when you refer to commercial incisiveness it's it's about moving in a quick and agile way to to get new ideas to market yeah that's right and you know as i said before as well you know we can't do everything that we think of either we have you know we can't spread ourselves too thin so you know we we firmly believe that ideas and innovation can come from anyone within the organization so really trying to find uh, opportunities for people to come forward with new ideas um but we will you know we will look at the market we'll look at competitors we'll We'll look, we'll we'll create a business case and we'll think about what we can really deliver and then try and place our bets um, sensibly and think about where, you know, where the opportunities are for the long term. So, uh, you know, one of the one of the areas that we've looked at, particularly in the last year or so, is mobile. And um, we've 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 paid quite a lot of attention to our our app product um, and really thinking about how we can take that to the next level. Last year, we really decided to take a bit of a new approach with our mobile mobile app. So we've always seen it um, as a companion app for our most loyal audience. Um, so those wanting to save recipes and organize their favorite recipes in their kind of my good food area um, and people looking for just that daily inspiration. Um, it's always previously been free to access and ad funded, um, but you know, with with the ad market so nascent for apps and there's so little user data available compared to the web, um, it wasn't really a profitable product for us. Um, but we knew that our users really valued the ease and the convenience of the product. So we took the decision to test a new model and we stripped the ads right back and invested in a whole raft of new exclusive recipes and content and some additional features and we relaunched it um, in December as a premium proposition with its own subscription. Um, so, you know, it's quite a, quite a big deal for us. We haven't done that much in, in the realm of paid content uh, yet. So we obviously wanted to protect and uh, look after the existing audience of the app. So we began with a three month free trial so that users could get used to the improvements that we've made and really kind of get to recognize it and enjoy using it. Um, but it, it, it's worked really well. We're really we're really pleased that now users uh, or the trialists are coming to the end of that free trial period. Uh, we're really pleased with the numbers converting through to paid subscription. Um, and they seem to be really enjoying it. And over half the users are using it every day. So that's given quite given us quite a lot of confidence um, and a, a valuable new revenue stream as well. 
And in terms of the content on the app, is that the, the, the print content um, or is it the web content or combination? It, it's the web content. So this is very different. It's separate to our digital edition. So obviously we, we've got our digital editions as well. So people who prefer to read the monthly magazine on their tablet um, or on their mobile, they can do that. And there's, there's a big demand for that as well, especially for overseas audience. Um, this is more about, you know, the utility of good food in your pocket on your phone and being able to get straight into search with a really slick, easy interface getting into search and where all you kind of save all your favorite stuff, basically. Um, so it's taking the whole database of good food content. It's linked with the account that people might have on the main website, but we've now kind of given it a real USP with all this um, wonderful premium uh, recipe content. And also we've done quite a bit with, um, with webinars over the lockdown period and kind of tutorials and all of that content, which you'd normally pay, you know, per view, um, or pay a one-off for those. That's all packaged up within the, within the app subscription as well. Uh, and in terms of communicating these offers to your audience, do you, do you, do you find there's any confusion in the audience between, you know, digital editions and, and this app? Do, do people get the two confused or is it a, a fairly clean proposition, do you think? Um, I think it's fairly clean. I mean, it's, it, we, we haven't really experienced much confusion. I mean, I know it would sound that way. And, you know, in, in the app store, I think Apple, and you know we, we, we're on apple and android phones but um in the in the app store for apple you know they do present them slightly differently so i think people understand there's that kind of reading experience and that kind of app and then there's more functional apps which this which this good food one is uh, and this new app or, or the, the the redesigned app i should say what, what does that tell you about the future direction of the brand do you think um, I think it's a bit of a, a testing ground for us, really. Um, we've not um, explored much paying, uh, charging for content as yet across the brand, although we're really interested in what other publishers are doing in this space. So this is really the first time that we've done that. So it's helping us to really understand where the value lies in the eyes of our, our users, You know, whether that be in the recipes or the features and functionality or the videos. Um, and that's going to help inform our, our strategy as we think about the, the main digital proposition as well. Now, of the various um, commercial initiatives you've launched over the last few years, you know, during lockdown, what was your most unexpected success? Uh, and was there any initiative which you had, let's say, high hopes for, but didn't quite take off in the way you expected? Um, oh, yeah, sure. So, I mean, one one thing that's been a real runaway success and we've been really delighted with is um, we are thinking about, you know, the, the lockdown and wanting to really have a, a strong dialogue with our community, with our, our audience. We we set up a group on Facebook, um, Good Food Together, um, helping people kind of cook together and, you know, share share their recipes, share their experiences online. That group has grown to be, you know, it's, it's well over 100,000 members now. Um, obviously it's a Facebook community. It's not ours solely. It's Facebook's community, but they are, they're all fans of good food. Um, they love the brand. And what's been really exciting is sort of the relationships that are formed between people, um, and the amount of, uh, ideas and wonderful, uh, creative recipes and things that people sharing with each other. So it's become a real proper community and it's, it's, it's generated loads of content for our products. So we feature, you know, ideas and uh, recipes and content from that community in our monthly magazines. Um, you know, every, every, it's a really important part of our content proposition now. But also that community is really useful for research and development. Um, we, can, we can float ideas past them. We can use them as a, as a survey test group. Uh, we we kind of work with them with commercial campaigns and, you know, we can create content uh, with that community. So that's been really, really interesting is how you can create content uh, within a community um, and how that community can be commercialized as well. That's That's been a wonderful success for us. What was your expectation when you launched it? I mean, it's obviously been a great success. I don't think we really knew. I think we just felt like it would be the right thing to do. It was very much a kind of um, an editorial initiative that as it scaled, we thought, actually, gosh, this is a really, really useful and interesting community for us. You know, they, they it's got a life of its own. 
Um, but it's really wonderful to be able to kind of talk to that community when we're testing new product ideas. For example, when we were launching the app, you know, we got some really great feedback from that community. Um, and also as we're thinking about, um, you know, uh, product reviews or we're asking people what they think of things, then, you know, it's, it's a really fantastic community to, 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 to leverage. It's interesting because before you launched that Facebook group, what, what was your, your, your main way of, you know, accessing community ideas and, you know, getting the kind of feedback which the Facebook group has enabled? Were you, did you have other, other means before that? Yeah, well, we have a user inbox and people are always emailing us and, you know, writing to us, be it, you know, something's gone wrong with my cake. It's not it's not rising all the way through to, you know, something about subscriptions. So, you know, we have a big uh, community of people who aren't afraid to talk to us Um, and actually all the way through the Good Food website. Um, people can comment on our recipes and comment on our content. Um, so people can, we have a, a Q and A and, you know, a dialogue going on around the content, but we've never had a forum as such. That's not something that we've, we've kind of had before. Um, so it's just really nice to, to see where that community goes of its own accord. Fantastic. And as for something which you launched, which didn't quite take off in the way you'd expect? Which you're prepared to admit to? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, there's plenty of things. Um, you know, they say if you don't fail, then you haven't tried hard enough, don't they? Um, okay. So, yeah, no, I think one example where it hasn't quite taken off as we thought it would, um, there's an offering that we launched where uh, people can create their own customized on-demand physical cookbook using recipes from the website. So kind of basically creating a new print product off of our digital content, um, which we're quite excited by. So people can create chapters and create a, a, a book for, for someone. So it's been really lovely for gifting uh, in the run up to Christmas or birthdays or going off to university. Um, so it's nice for, for gifting or keepsakes, but it's been quite niche. So, you know, it's ticking along. It's just interesting, you know, lots and lots of great ideas, but you never know what's you know what's necessarily going to really resonate with people i think it sounds like a great idea so um yeah so go, go I, and still, buy one I, I, I will do one. <laughs> promise promise okay so so bbc good food was one of the, the big lockdown successes as we all know so you know as we emerge from the pandemic you know, how do you plan to hold on to your to the new readers you've gained and build on the progress made well, I mean, sadly, you know, we've moved straight from one global crisis to the next, basically, haven't we? With the spiraling, spiraling living costs and the energy crisis and the Ukraine war. And, you know, people face with huge challenges in terms of how to feed themselves and their families on a budget. Um, you know, we've seen, I think it was from about March time, our budget recipe content has just shot up in terms of popularity. Um, and, you know, we know that when the winter comes, some people will have to choose between turning on their heating or turning on their ovens. So, you know, we see this really, this, you know, this, this, this challenge as a crisis equivalent to lockdown, basically. So, you know, that we're turning our attention to that. How do we really respond? How do we change what we're doing to stay relevant? Um, and we're launching a new campaign uh, next month called Cook Smart, and that'll be across, you know, print and digital and will really be a long-term content plan to offer practical advice and recipes and meal plans to everyone affected by the rising costs. Um, so we see this as like a two-way conversation with our audience as well. So we're going to be asking for their tips and questions and opinions too. Um, so, you know, it's about remaining useful, basically. Um, but in terms of holding on to the readers that we've acquired through the lockdown, I mean, we our key strategic focus um, for a number of years has been on loyalty and engagement. Uh, across print and digital, and we saw a big uh, boost in demand for magazine subscriptions, as as many other publishers did. Um, and you know, as well as that, we we use CRM tools to really understand what action users might want next to take, and serve up targeted content and marketing messages based on what we're learning about people. So you know, it, it's really about delivering up the right and the relevant content to the user at the right time. And uh, in terms of the, the as you say, the cost of living crisis, is that showing itself already on, 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 in your output or is that something which you're planning to launch in the near future, you know, a, a channel dedicated towards, let's say, budget cooking and, and budgeting? Yes. Yeah, so I think it's going to be it's, it's going to be one of our big uh, editorial pillars. It, it, it already it has been a, an editorial pillar for us for some time, but I think it's going to be just increasingly important. 
Um, you know, so we have, you know, a specific campaign launching, but we're already definitely starting to see that come through in terms of what people are searching for, um, how people are arriving at uh, our website, what they're looking for. We're seeing it come through in, you know, questions uh, and comments on our on our pages. I think there was a question recently, you know, what's the most energy efficient way to cook a sausage? You know, is it grilling? Is it roasting? Is it frying? The, the answer, in case you're interested, is actually microwaving. Um, but, you know, pe people are really thinking about this and how they can be more energy efficient. Um, so we're, we're, we're looking at how we can uh, do less, you know, recipes that rely on having your oven on and, and things like that. And how do people uh, make, make their budget go further? So it's already starting to happen and um, coming through as a consolidated campaign in the next month or so. Now, as you look across the consumer magazine, consumer media sector as a whole um what you, and you might have probably touched on some of these issues but what, what would you say are the main opportunities you see across the sector as a whole and, and what should publishers publishers been doing to take advantage so yes i mean there are opportunities i think actually it's going to be quite a challenging time uh, as we see it lying ahead um as media companies are also going to be grappling with the rising costs as well and a volatile market um, and, you know, we're, we're quote, most likely heading into recession. So, you know, publishers are probably in a better place than many other businesses, having built up multiple revenue streams and having that emotional connection with audiences. Um, but yeah, yeah, I think it's, I think we're going into quite a challenging time. Um, but one, one example is, you know, obviously the looming cookie crisis threatening to undermine, you know, the programmatic, um, advertising landscape in terms of third party data and a lot of middlemen in the ad landscape are probably going to be finding or are already finding that their model is under threat um, whereas publishers can really leverage their first party data and their verified you know quality audiences that we can target in a thousand different ways so clients are always going to be drawn to that so I would think that that most publishers would be in a strong position there. So at Amedia, how long have you been addressing the, the, the cookie issue for? Has this been something which you've been working towards um, finding the answer to for a, for a while? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, we've seen this coming. It's certainly not my area of expertise. Um, so I probably couldn't speak to it with, with, with that much intelligence, but it's definitely something that we've, we've been preparing for and trying to ensure that we are, are gaining as much first party data as possible and making sure that's uh, really robust um, and uh, in really good fit state to be able to um, to work with with third parties to target. Now, the PPA judges, going back to your award win last year, they praised your special focus on diversity. Um, can, can you talk us through your thinking in this area and the measures you put in place? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, so with our scale, um, we we feel we have a, a responsibility to give a platform to voices too rarely given space in the food media world. Um, so we're constantly evolving to try and make our content richer and more relevant to how we live and eat today. Um, so we've been working hard to make space, both physical in terms of pages in the magazine and also in the conversation uh, for new voices and crucially, diverting our editorial budget, putting our money where our mouth is and making sure that we're paying our contributors fairly. And that's been really key. Um, so we're really committed to trying to grow a new audience by introducing more diverse and inclusive content. Um, so that means commissioning new writers and new recipes and features. Um, so we've seen, for example, bbcgoodfood.com become the number one in the UK and Google for things like Ramadan recipes and Diwali recipes and Holi and Eid, Passover recipes and Chinese New Year, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but we do also, you know, as well as um, seeing diversity as a pillar in itself, um, we also see it as a really integral part of all of the, the Good Food Pillars um, so running all the way through our content. So we've been actively concentrating on recruiting some new voices, not just to write about topics associated with their heritage, uh, but also in our biggest pillars, which are health and family and recipes. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's it, we're definitely on a journey. I would certainly not say that we are, you know, that, w that we've nailed it at all. Um, but we, uh, we have made a lot of pro uh, progress. And I think people would recognize that in the, the change in our output over the last uh, 12 or 18 months. Um, but we also recognize that real change comes from having diverse voices from within the team. 
So, you know, we've we've tried to make DNI a, a priority in recruitment. Um, we volunteered for the Media Trust's Kickstart scheme, which tackles the growing number of young people at risk of long term unemployment um, due to the pandemic and provides government funding support for, for placements for 16 to 24 year olds. Um, so that's that's been really great for us. And we've had some really interesting young talent join the business um, to to make sure that we're not just always recruiting the same type of person. And where where next on the diversity road? Do you think we'll get to a position where diversity is just a way of life um, and doesn't need kind of a special initiative as such? Yeah, I think that's what we're trying to, you know, that's what we're we're acknowledging, I suppose, as a team, is that it's about... um, it's about working with a more diverse range of writers across the full spectrum of topics and making sure that we are being uh, mindful when we are, you know, working in terms of uh, photography and to be representative, not just in terms of racial diversity, but age and, you know, disability and all of those things as well. So, you know, as I say, it's, we're definitely on a journey, but um, I think our content is, is much the richer for it. Now, in October 2020, you were also given responsibility for the parent, parenting portfolio, as, as you mentioned earlier. Um, what, we've talked a lot about food today, but what, what are the specific marketing challenges and opportunities in, in the parenting market? Um, so, yeah, it's a, it's a really, really um, wonderful m- vertical to, to, uh, to be working on and one that I hadn't worked on before recently. I mean, the wonderful thing about the parenting market is that people won't ever stop having babies, um, just as they won't, they won't stop cooking and eating. Um, so, you know, and also... Evergreen. Yes, exactly. Um, and it's, you know, it is a time of life when, you know, as new parents, people are thrown into this situation where there's suddenly in need of so much advice and guidance, um, including all those important purchasing decisions when you have a baby, like what buggy to buy or what brand of nappy cream to buy, or even, you know, the big ones, like should should you move house? Should you change your car? Where should you go on holiday now? Um, So with Made for Mums, we've really kind of homed in on meeting that need. And our mission is to help parents make confident choices when they're when they're choosing what to buy. So we feel that we've got a real sweet spot in terms of having a very engaged community of parents who love to participate and test products for us at home with the, you know, children, babies of the right appropriate age for those products um, and the expertise in our editors who can provide that rigor and impartial view. So, you know, we, we bring all those things to bear to, to really kind of um, become the, the best place where people can just choose uh, what to buy. Um, the challenge is that it's quite a distributed market and there's lots of competition from established and new players. Um, there's a lot of great influencers on social. Um, the government is increasingly providing quite a lot of parenting advice directly as well, uh, which we obviously don't want to stand in the way of and you know, want to make sure people get, get, get the right access to, uh, to advice from the right experts. So, you know, as ever, it's, I think, again, about knowing what your purpose is and then executing it really well. And in terms of the community um, for the brand, um, how how is that? Where where is that community? Is it it a Facebook community or is it how how do you communicate with them? Well, we do have a forum as well um, on Made for Mums. So uh, so our community um, form groups uh, there. So we've got, for example, you know, a groups around pregnancy, groups around trying to conceive. Uh, and they, those are very supportive communities that, um, yeah, that the people I think really rely on at a, a, a quite a, a worrying stage of life. Uh, but we also have a community that, yes, we do use Facebook because we think, well, they've got a, they've got the community. Let's work on that platform. So we've got what we've called a, a top testers club uh, where people can register with us to sign up to be a, one of our testers. And we, we, we put them through quite a um, quite a comprehensive list of questions so we can find out all about what they would be qualified to to test on our behalf. And then they join our community. We, we, we ship products out to them. We get people using them. We get feedback from them. And that really helps us um, be very confident about what we're recommending as, as the right choices for people to buy. And the keys for success in this market, because... It's a fast-moving market, as you say. 
you know, there'll always be demand for the content. But I suppose once people have had their babies, they move on and won't continue subscribing. So what are the keys to success, long term success in the parenting market? Yes. Um, well, I think data comes into it again. So obviously, if we know when people are about to have their baby, um, then we know when, you know, when they'll be crawling, we know when they'll be uh, weaning, we know when they're going to need to move on to the next stage of life. So it, it really becomes um, understanding that life cycle and being able to, you know, respond and give people the the right appropriate content for for the moment in their in their lives of their child. And obviously, at immediate, we've got um, a, a big children's portfolio as well. It's it's in a different part of the business, so you know we know that we've got content that's going to be um, really relevant for them as as they grow up and they move out of the made for mums audience. But then they're maybe going to be ripe for you know some of our other products. Now, Alex, 20 years ago, it's a long time ago, 2002, you were the founder director of the Association of Online Publishers. Um, now, if I you know. look back at the... In I know, <laughs> it dates us all. Um, <laughs> if you look back at the industry's priorities then, you know, when, when you were the, the director, what are the main differences between then and now, do you think? Well, yes, I know. And I, I <laughs> when we were talking earlier, I just can't quite believe that it is 20 years ago, but then it does feel that way sometimes as well, doesn't it? So yeah, I mean, back then, publishing online was quite nascent. And, you know, online ad trading was like the Wild West. Um, and we were as AOP, you know, we were newly formed, we formed out of PPA, uh, PPA's interactive um, or digital committee, and wanted to, you know, embrace publishers from different backgrounds from broadcasters and newspapers as well. And the AOP was was born. Um, you know, a lot of it was actually working hard with with other bodies like um, the IAB and um, the bodies representing the advertising industry as well, ISBAR, uh, et cetera, and ABC Electronic to try and establish the, the trust and the rules and the transparency that you that are just essential for business. Um, so there was a lot of kind of forming of the industry really and trying to, to lay down the ground rules of how this, this should all work. Um, but, you know, for our members at the time, publishers were were trying to or our members that we worked with were trying to justify internally that investment from their companies into digital they were they were worried about cannibalization of their print products or you know or many of them were um you know that's that's very different now isn't it and of course those that just went for it and embraced change are the ones that have thrived um but yeah, it, it was a, again a very, very exciting time to be to be in the online media world, and you know, it really ignited my my love of of the industry. Uh, but back then, we were worried about the dominance and influence of the big portals like AOL and Yahoo, um, and social media and video and mobile were all right in their infancy back then. You know, we knew that they were coming, but they weren't there yet. If you think about something like AI, you know, that would have blown our minds, uh, <laughs> you know, at the time. So, yes, yeah, so much has changed. And in particular, there has been a huge amount of consolidation, lots of buying and selling of, of these wonderful brands. Um, but, but many things have also remained true. And, you know, a very high number of those same great media brands are still thriving and doing really, really well. And, you know, the key thing is that consumers love great content and you know journalism can really influence people and the trust and relationship with uh that we have with audiences is a really precious thing so um yeah some some things don't change uh, and in terms of the crystal ball you know if we, we've gone back 20 years if we go forward 20 years to 2042 that's a that's oh my gosh eye watering what, what do think... you think the industry will look like in, <laughs> in 20 years time i won't ask whether you'll still be in it but what do you think um... the industry will look like, look like? <laughs> yeah. I don't I, I don't think I could comment then hopefully someone will still be giving me a job um yeah that's a really tough one isn't it I mean well I mean to be honest between climate change and the threat of nuclear war let's just hope we're all still here um <laughs> but I, I don't know it, it's tough we'll probably all live and work in in virtual worlds by then um and you know maybe we'll be continuously targeted on the basis of our biometrics um it's oh, quite just that's quite dystopian isn't it um yes, but yeah, no, I, I hope that some of the lessons of the last couple of years will also have stayed with us and, you know, real life relationships will still be where most of us find, you know, our meaning. Excellent. We'll, we'll talk about the, the, mentioning the metaverse. Has, has um, Immediate Media, Good Food, got any thoughts on, on where that might go? Um, I don't know, really. It's sort of watching with interest. Um, you know, Zuckerberg is 
you know, always an interesting character um, to follow. Um, yeah, watch, watching and waiting to see, to be honest. I'm not sure. Probably others of our brands might um, uh, might get there before we do. But yeah, always interesting to, to watch. Uh, and Alex, what excites you most about the future of consumer media? I think it's I think it's the potential for well-loved brands like ours to be relevant and make a real difference in people's lives and to rich enrich society, which I think we've really understood maybe for the first time since COVID. You know, which changed a lot of things, made a lot of people reevaluate their priorities, and you know, in some cases, the lucky ones have been able to spend more time on the things they're passionate about. Um, so, you know, I work for Immediate Media. Immediate has a vision statement, which is about helping to create happiness and fulfillment by enabling people to do more of what they love. And I think, you know, good food is a great example of that. Uh, so is Olive, so is Made for Mums. Um, so, you know, I think for me, that's really, that's pretty exciting. Uh, and finally, Alex, a question we ask all our guests on the podcast, outside of work, um, how do you relax? <laughs> Um, well, I have a young family, so most of my spare time is uh, spent having fun with them and trying to maintain some sense of order in my chaotic household. Um, but we we love long walks with our Labrador. We were one of the many uh, lockdown cliches who, who got a puppy during the lockdown. Um, so we love to have long walks, uh, pub lunches with fan, friends and family. Uh, we read a lot in my family. I've got a lot of books, read a lot of magazines, of course. And cooking. Um, you can't really work on good food and not enjoy food. So cooking is a big part of my life too. Okay, well, I must ask one, one kind of follow-up question on, on, on books. Um, any any good books you've read recently which you can recommend? Oh, yeah, many. Um, yeah, I, I'm reading a fantastic book at the moment um, called A Manual for Cleaning Women, um, which is a collection of stories um, uh, published by a lady, American lady, who's um, it, all published posthumously, actually, but she she's a fantastic character. That's the book I'm reading at the moment, but you've caught me off guard with that. <laughs> that I question. did, didn't I? <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, well, one, one final question then. on cooking. Yeah. What was your favourite dish to cook then? Oh, oh my goodness. Um, oh, I like a I like a good chocolate cake. Uh, it's my it's just been my kids' birthdays, both of them, over the last uh, week and. Good Foods Ultimate Chocolate Cake uh, is an absolute winner. Crowd pleaser every single time. I would highly recommend. That's a good recommendation. Alex White, thank you very much for being our guest on the In Publishing podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, James. A final word from our valued podcast sponsor. Air Business is trusted by 4,000 publications and 3 million happy subscribers, with 10 million customer records on file. It processes £500 million each year in 22 currencies and delivers over 300 million items. Find out more at airbusiness.com. Many thanks to Alex for being our guest this time. I particularly liked her focus on brands having a clear sense of purpose and not trying to be all things to all people. You can find out more about Immediate Media at their website, immediate.co.uk. If Alex's mention of chocolate cake got your mouth watering, then just search Ultimate Chocolate Cake at bbcgoodfood.com. For more information about us and to listen to previous podcasts, please go to our website in publishing.co.uk. Thank you for listening. We'll be back in a few weeks' time for another podcast. Bye for now. <laughs>